Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How does the loss of various animal sp species negatively impact both the environment and people worldwide? What is the Jane Goodall Institute doing to help save endangered species as well as combating global warming and climate change? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other hot button issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're going to focus on an issue, and that's the loss of animal species. This is a very important issue. Sometimes it's a quiet issue. My special guest today is someone who's very knowledgeable of this particular problem and is going to bring us up to date on what we can do and what has been done to help save more animals and get them off the endangered species list. Dr. Jane Goodall, a native of England, spent many years studying the chimps of Gombe in Tanzania. Dr. Goodall in 1977 founded the Jane Goodall Institute for Research, Education, and Conservation, which launched establishing chimpanzee sanctuaries in four African countries. Dr. Jane Goodall, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being with me today. You have had one of the most remarkable careers in working with the chimpanzees and devoting your life to really focusing the spotlight on how we can save endangered species. And we're going to get into all of that in just a moment. But right at the beginning, let me ask you, you are also, and I didn't mention this in the introduction, you are also a United Nations Messenger of Peace. What is a United Nations Messenger of Peace and what do you do? I was invited to be a Messenger of Peace by Kofi Annan. And when he talked to me about, you know, highlighting some of the UN issues that are that, um, important for peace around the world. I said, but you know, Kofi, I can't travel more than I do. I'm already traveling 300 days a year. And, you know, every day is packed. And he said, I wouldn't ask anybody to do what you do. Just do what you do, carry on doing it, and just occasionally talk about the UN if you think the initiative is something that's important for you. Right. Now, the reason you're in New York right now Part of that 300 days of traveling around the world, you're in New York right now, is to focus attention on the International Day of Peace. And of course, each year at the United Nations and in tens of thousands of other communities around the world, there, there are special programs, there are special ceremonies commemorating the International Day of Peace, which was set up by the United Nations General Assembly, I think in 1981, mm -hmm. if memory serves. And so you're in New York and there's a special ceremony at the United Nations with the ringing of a bell. What, uh, tell us a little bit about that ceremony. Well, it's a, it's a very moving ceremony. The bell was made uh, from coins that were donated by Japanese school children after the war to sort of celebrate peace. And I suppose that when I was made a messenger of peace, I was given this little dove to pin on my lapel, which I nearly always wear. And one of our youth decided to create a giant peace dove puppet, which we now fly to commemorate the peace day within these few days surrounding the UN peace day. Um, this year we hope to fly in more than 40 countries and they have a 20 foot wingspan and we had one at the UN. That peace bell is a, you know, there's something very symbolic about ringing a bell, releasing doves, flying peace dove puppets. There are and certain, yes please. Yeah, what I was going to say, if you dare to vision a world of peace, if you can actually imagine it and think about it, it's that much more likely to happen. It certainly will. And of course, it really is so important to have celebrities such as yourself, Michael Douglas, Elie Wiesel, and other messengers of peace. George Clooney is a messenger of peace, I Yo -yo Ma. Exactly right. So it's very important to have you focus attention because you can bring the, the attention, the cameras, the media to these problems. And of course, we all need to be working towards world peace, obviously. Well, let's go back to your interest in Africa. 
you spent many years in Africa. You worked with the chimpanzees in Tanzania, and you've been involved in many other areas. How did you get involved in that? What was your motivation to go to Africa and live in, in probably not too pristine conditions, I wouldn't imagine, or very, very natural conditions, but not, uh, you didn't have all the acutements and the, the everything that the, we'd have in a modern society. I loved animals from the age of, uh, well, ever since I was born, apparently. And I had a very supportive mother who encouraged my dreams. When I was 11, I decided I would grow up, go to Africa, live with animals, and write books about them. We had no money. We couldn't afford university. But my mother always used to say, if you really want something and you work hard and you never give up, you will find a way. So I was invited to Kenya, actually, by a school friend. And I heard about the late Louis Leakey. And went to see him, he gave me a job, and that led to him offering me this incredible opportunity to go and live, not just with any animal, but the one more like us than anything else. That was in 1960. And the study will be in its fifth, it'll be have our 50th anniversary next July, which, I mean, half a century. And we're still learning new things about these amazing chimpanzees. Yes. Now, you said they are more like us. In what ways are they more like us? Or through DNA or? DNA, no. we differ by just over 1%. The structure of the blood, the immune system, the brain is almost the same. It's a bit smaller. And then in their social behavior, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another on the back, obviously intellectual abilities, which we used to think unique to us, which makes sense when you think of the similarity in the brain. Uh, long-term affectionate supportive bonds between family members through a life that can be anything uh, beyond 60 years. And they show altruism, love, compassion. They also have a dark side to their nature. They're capable of violence and even a kind of primitive war. Uh, they're certainly very similar to humans, obviously. What were some of the major uh, were there major surprises that when you went to Africa? Maybe you thought things were going to be a certain way. You had a stereotype that I that I expect it to be this way and things were somewhat different? Oh, I'd read so much. I knew what they were going to be like. So when I got there, my first trip into the bush was with Louis Leakey to Olduvai Gorge on the Serengeti Plains, and I felt I was going home. And then when I got to Gombe, which is the forest, it was even more like home. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Louis Leakey. Who was he? What did he do? Louis Leakey was a very famous paleontologist, also with a great interest in Africa's animals and he searched for the fossilized remains of early humans. This is why he wanted me to go and study the chimpanzees, creatures more like us than anything else. And he reckoned that maybe if we shared a, a common ancestor about seven million years ago, if we found behavior similar or the same in modern man and modern chimpanzee, perhaps that behavior was in the uh, common ancestor and therefore helped him to interpret the behavior of the fossils he was uncovering, our ancestors. Most assuredly, most assuredly. What were some of the major lessons that you learned from the chimpanzees and from your work with Dr. Leakey and living in, in the, basically in the wild? Well, the, the, the lessons kind of, they changed, but you know, one lesson which wasn't so important for me, but it helped me to share it with the rest of the world is that We've been so arrogant. There's no sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's a blurry line. It's getting more blurry all the time. And if we have a new respect for these chimpanzee beings who are so like us, then also we should have greater respect for the other amazing animals with whom we share the planet. And the chimps teach us we are not the only beings with personality, mind, and above all, feelings. And those feelings are shared by animals in all kinds of different groups. And of course, this really motivated you to set up the Jane Goodall Institute. And I know many of our viewers would like to get more information on this, and they can go to www.janegoodall.org, right. I believe. That's and correct. so that would be a good place to get more information and to look at this really remarkable career that you've had, the remarkable background in this particular area. Let's talk a little bit about the, well, let's talk about the Jane Goodall Institute. What uh, we, you set it up, and how did it get started? What, obviously, the, your living with the chimpanzees played into this, but what, what is it, how did it get going, and what does it do today? Well, it got going because some of my students were kidnapped. and kidnapped. The, the kidnap, kidnapped by a group from Eastern Congo. And the funding that I had enjoyed, me and my students, because we had a research team, uh, dried up at that point. So one of my good friends, 
uh, set up the institute way back in 1977, initially for ca carrying on at Gombe. But right from the beginning, I wanted it broader, conservation, education. And it became increasingly important to raise money because it, by the early 70s, the chimpanzees, which had numbered more than a million when I began in 1960, had already begun an alarming um, decrease in numbers. By the early 80s, when the big logging companies moved into the Central African rainforests, the numbers began to plummet very fast. Today, we don't think there's more than 300,000. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the other great apes in Africa, the orangutans in Indonesia. And it, that, that, that is typical of what's happening to animal species around the planet as wilderness areas gradually decrease. Exactly, and these, uh, you mentioned the gorillas, the, the silverback gorillas, and the, the gorillas in Rwanda and different places like that are, are certainly under, they're under threat. They're yeah. really under siege right now, and a lot of it is because of encroachment, because of humans coming into their areas, and of course, some of them are killed because for, for whatever reason, and uh, they're poached, and it, of course, it's a major problem. It's the bush meat that's the biggest problem. Is What is bush meat? Bush, the bush meat trade is the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. It's not the subsistence hunting that's gone on um, for hundreds of years. It's mostly logging companies, to some extent mining companies, making roads. The roads give access to the hunters. And they'll go to the end of a logging road, for example, and they'll shoot everything, like elephants, gorillas, chimpanzees, monkeys, birds, bats, pigs, antelopes, anything that can be smoked. And then on the trucks go into the cities where the urban elite will pay more for it than a piece of chicken or goat. And it's completely mm -hmm. unsustainable. And it, it's more than decimating these incredible animals of the African rainforest. So if it were really the indigenous people who were killing them just at a, a much lower level, there wouldn't be as much of a problem, obviously. But no, there wouldn't be is, at all. Right, they, they mm -hmm. could uh, basically reproduce and make up the ones who were, who were lost. So, Now, you, you've uh, undertaken a variety of things. One was the Chimpanzee Guardian Project. What exactly is that and how did, how did it uh, Well, the bushmeat bush trade <laughs> gives rise to a number of little orphan chimps. Because in the old days, no hunter would shoot a mother with a baby of any species. I mean, you just you wouldn't because you want you want your supply in the future. But today, the mothers will be shot. The babies, there's no point selling them for meat. The hunter will try and get some money by selling them alive as a pet or to attract attention to a bar in a hotel or something. And it's illegal in all the chimp range countries across the Congo Basin and in West Africa. Chimps are endangered, and so it's possible for the government to confiscate these babies, but then what to do with them? So we have set up sanctuaries, other organizations as well. And th these orphans, you know, it's very expensive. In Congo Brazzaville, we have f over 100, we got 144 orphans, many of whom are full grown. It's expensive to care for them. I get accused of wasting money looking after individuals, but you know, the people, the local people, as much as possible, we encourage, encourage to come and visit the sanctuary. And when they go away, they say, I'll never eat a chimpanzee again. I didn't realize how like us they were. So they're ambassadors for their kind. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, and the main purpose of Global Connections is to focus attention on international issues that impact people from Frankfurt, Kentucky, to Frankfurt, Germany, and from Lima, Ohio, to Lima, Peru. Welcome back to our program. Today we're focusing on endangered species and the negative impact that losing these species can have on both humans and the environment. My special guest today is someone who's very knowledgeable of this entire situation, especially how it impacts chimpanzees. Dr. Jane Goodall, a native of England, spent many years studying the chimpanzee of Gombe in Tanzania. Dr. Goodall in 1977 founded the Jane Goodall Institute for Research, Education, and Conservation. Dr. Goodall, we're talking about 
the loss of species in general and chimpanzees you mentioned a minute ago that you think the chimpanzees the chimpanzee population has gone from a million down to 300,000 which is really a huge drop 66 percent mm. almost and if it continues at that rate it will go uh, eventually they can be wiped out uh, is this stabilizing now I know you're you're making a lot of converts you're explaining to people you're working with them to help them to raise their uh, really their comprehension of how important these animals are but are we starting to stabilize or is it still I know it's a major problem mm. but is it getting better no, I, I don't think it is yet. We have many partners on the ground in the Congo Basin, including uh, UNEP, UNEP. And, you know, we're, it's a, this bushmeat trade is a huge business. And, of course, the timber concessions that are being sold today, many going to the Chinese uh, to help s support their development. And an awful lot of money is involved in these both, both of these trades, the logging, and then there's the mining of coltan, which is destroying the habitat and causing the deaths of hundreds of animals in eastern Congo. And, you know, the more, the more I was traveling in Africa to talk about chimpanzees and rainforests and protecting them, the more I realized that so many of Africa's problems can be directly related to the unsustainable lifestyles of the elite around the world and the developed world and the average American, the average European and our unsustainable lifestyles. So that on the one hand you've got crippling poverty and then on the other hand you have people who are taking so much more than our fair share of the, uh, the non-renewable natural resources. You have brought up a very important point and obviously people everywhere around the world they want to upgrade. Everyone aspires to be, quote, middle class, middle socioeconomic levels, and to enjoy the finer things of life, to have air conditioning, to have a car. And of course, the majority of the people in the world do not have this, these luxuries. And it, we really, you hit upon, I think, one of the major problems in that we have these non-renewable sources of energy that we're using, for example, oil, coal, we see the coal coming out of West, well, West Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and what have you, the coal cars rumbling across the country. We also have this situation, though, where we have 6.5 billion people mm -hmm. on the face of the earth. Now, these people are raising their, their standards. They're using more energy. They're using more coal. They're using more oil. And the United Nations predicts that by 2050, we'll have 9 billion people. That's a third more, basically, than what we have right now. How do you see this as far as our non-renewable sources of energy? What should we be doing? And how many people can this earth support? I mean, the resources are not finite, obviously. You have only so many resources. But how do you, how do you see these two variables? Well, I mean, if we use up all the resources we have, that's the end of the human race. And long before then, we'll have created a planet that's virtually uninhabitable. And as far as, you know, the, the loss of species, we are in the middle of the sixth great extinction. We're losing small, seemingly insignificant species of animal and plant every day, particularly in the rainforest. And we don't know yet, we don't know enough. Take out one little species, that may fa affect another, which may affect a third, and you can end up with a complete collapse of that ecosystem. We don't know what we're doing. And if we can't get a handle on population growth, then I think in the long run we're doomed. So, you know, to me we have these three seemingly uh, insoluble problems. The human population growth, the crippling poverty of more people living than the land can support, and the unsustainable lifestyles of those who take resources from places, they've exhausted theirs perhaps, so they take them from somewhere else. And we have to learn to do with less. We have to try and find um, energy sources like solar, like wind, like the currents, uh, which all those technologies theoretically are possible, create um, methane gas out of our waste that we use rather than sending it up into the ether to be one of the greenhouse gases, which is leading to climate change, which if it continues unabated, I mean, I was just in Greenland and I stood there and I saw these huge slabs of ice fall off at a time of year when they shouldn't be falling and the in Inuits were weeping because their land was being destroyed. If all that ice melted, and pray God it won't, but if it did up in the Arctic, the sea levels would rise by seven meters around the world. Well, we know what would happen if 
I mean, we can't, we cannot live. So we've got to, I mean, I came away with the message, each one of us must do everything we can to reduce our own um, CO2 emissions, um, methane gas, which comes from intensive farming of animals, and everything is so interrelated. Exactly. And this, as you mentioned, this is a major problem. And of course, you mentioned the United Nations too a moment ago, UNEP, the UN Environment Program. And the United Nations has really taken the lead through a variety of conferences, the UN Conference on Environment and Development in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro was one that really launched this discussion. I know the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has very, been very instrumental in moving this whole climate change issue forward. And the UN has really been, I think, the main driver behind this. But you're right, the, the countries of the world, the governments, mm -hmm. the businesses, the people, everyone has a stake in this. And as you mentioned, if the oceans rose 21 meters, Florida would be just a, a reef. Mm. There would be no Florida because mm. the average height's about, I think it's about seven feet above sea level. So, and mm. it's not just Florida, but no, uh, no, islands island, in island, the Pacific and other places. Some have already been evacuated. That's, That's right. It. And Bangladesh will soon virtually be gone. And all the coastal areas, parts of England are washing away already. And, you know, I was really thrilled when the, the UN issued uh, an appeal to the people to eat less meat because people don't realize that the, the um, methane emissions of intensively farmed animals is a greater contributor to greenhouse gases than all the cars of the planet. I, I didn't know that, but it, it happens to be true. So, you know, how do we do this? I mean, what gets me is that we're bringing little children into this world. Uh, many of them are in environments where the food they eat, the air they breathe, and the water they drink is actually making them sick. Uh, we're pouring chemical pesticides and fertilizers and you know emissions from industry and from households and golf courses. Uh, we're poisoning the planet for the future. And this is why I'm devoting so much of my time to working with young people. And it was the work with the young people, our Roots and Shoots groups, that are now in 111 countries with about 10,000 active groups. It was that work that caused uh, Kofi Annan to ask me to be a messenger of peace. Because we are about trying to break down the barriers we build between not only people of different cultures and religions and nations, but between us and the natural world. And people, our viewers can learn more about Roots and Shoots if they go to www.janegoodall.org and learn more about the Jane Goodall Institute and many of these issues that we're talking about today and they are so very important. And as you mentioned with the, the melting of the ice, this is something that it's accelerating and it's something that could absolutely devastate the earth as we know it and devastate humankind. Yeah. So we really need to, to move forward on it. Well, you have a new book and we, I know we don't have time to go into it, but I wanna make sure I get this right. Hope for Animals and Their World, How Endangered Species Are Being Rescued from the Brink. You're doing it. What are some of the other ways we can do? What, what can we do to help rescue endangered species? Well, the, po the point of this book is pulling out the success stories. It, as I travel around, I meet incredible people who see that a species is endangered and they think, I love this animal or this plant, this bird, whatever it is. I'm not going to let it go. And they don't give up. And because of that, they, the, the stories in this book are incredibly inspirational. And it does tell people what they can do. And it's all these little ways, the choices we make. Let's think about the effect on the environment, on animal welfare, on human health, of the things we buy, the way we live our lives. You know, if you start thinking like that, you make these small changes. And what we can do is think about the world as it is today. How do we want to leave it to our children? How do we want it to be for our great-great-grandchildren? And if we start thinking in those terms, how does the decision I make today affect my great-great-grandchildren? Uh, then we start thinking about what we do in a more responsible way. And I know because it's happening. It certainly is, most assuredly. Well, this is so important, the work you're doing now. Of the endangered species, do, do we have an idea, first off, of how many species we've lost? Do they have any, is there a ballpark figure? Some, oh yeah, I don't remember it. But, but it's, it's large. It's, it's so big I don't want to remember it, let's <laughs> put it that way. It's not Mostly news. they're small, <laughs> yes. but not entirely. We lost um, a, a monkey with the lovely name of Miss Waldron's Colobus this century. And you know, she's followed the dodo. We lost the, um, the, the dolphin in China. Um, 
we're losing big animals too, and the polar bear is going to go. I don't know how we can save it. Mm -hmm. it. It does look very bleak for the polar bear. It certainly does. It looks as though extinction is imminent. And of course, there are many groups working to try to reverse that trend right now. Well, it's, it's very important. You mentioned partners, and you can do so much. Each individual group can do so much. You referenced the United Nations Environment Program as being a partner. Who are some of your other partners? I know you, you addressed the Rotary Convention in Birmingham, England in June of 2009 and talked to Rotarians, over 20,000 Rotarians, I believe, who were there. But Rotary is one of your partners. Well, we'll just say Rotary. How do you network with Rotary? Well, we've only just begun our networking with Rotary, but Rotary has a wonderful program for young people, and we hope to increasingly interact in that way. Um, and that some of our youth leaders who are talented, are, they're speaking and addressing Rotary Club. Some of them uh, have come to us from the Rotary Fellowship. Some of our youth are going into the Rotary Fellowship. So there's a lot of ways we can collaborate with them. And we work with UNHCR, with the refugees. The High Commission for Refugees, yes. yes. Um, we, we work in the Congo Basin, not only with the other NGOs on the ground and World Bank and um, USAID, United States Overseas Aid, um, but also with the, with the logging companies to try and reduce the impact that they're making on the forest. And you know, I spend a lot of time talking in China talking about the environmental problems they face and talking to the young people about ways in which some of these can be solved. India, another country where you know there's massive rapid development. So Roots and Shoots is growing there. It's all over mainland China. It's growing in Australia. It's in every US state. And it's linking young people around the world so that they can share not only the problems but the solutions. And mm -hmm. For, they're forming a family. Do you remember the book, The Family of Man, that came out, I think, after World War I or World yes, War II? Yes. It was a, one mm -hmm. of the first books where it showed that people are people and, and we're all sharing the same heart and the same aspirations, whatever the color of our skin or the culture in which we live. It had small black and white pictures. That made a huge impact on me. And I see our Roots and Shoots program as creating another family of man. Mm -hmm. Well, we're down to our last few seconds, but let, let me ask you, Dr. Goodall, if you had one wish, what is your one wish for humankind? What should we be thinking about or doing? Well, I suppose it's, it's almost impossible, but if we could just find a way to control the growth of our number so that we can all live in harmony, then I think we would see less war, uh, we would see much more love around the planet, and our young people could grow up without fear. And this is so extremely important, and the work that you're doing is very, very important, and you have reached people, not just in the United States, but in all parts of the world, and people are looking at you and looking at the tremendous work you're doing, and you're really raising our consciousness level, and this is a great opportunity for us to make a contribution. Well, Dr. Jane Goodall, I wanna thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program. 